So now before I get excited and get too far ahead of myself with the text, I want you to notice a couple things. First, they, and I mean the disciples, went to where Jesus had told them to go. They went to the mountain. And mountains have a logical religious symbolism for in biblical cultures, since mountains are closer to God because God was believed to dwell in the heavens as in the sky. And as a result, God often reveals God's very self when one is on the mountain. Now, according to the Gospel of Bruce, who is still looking for a publisher, the mountain is a place or are places where one is more open to experiencing the sacred, to encountering God. And Jesus points his disciples to the place where they will be open to experiencing the divine, God's very self. That's where Jesus points us, to the very place that we're going to be open to experiencing God's very self. Now, second thing I want you to notice is that when the disciples got there, it says that they worshipped him. But in that time of worship, what, what also does it say? Some doubted. So I want you to to hold this notion of doubt because it's relevant. Because if those 11 disciples, Jesus' best friends, doubted, for us who doubt a lot, I think it's okay. Pope Francis recently said this, We do not need to be afraid of questions and doubts because they are the beginning of a path of knowledge and going deeper. One who does not ask questions cannot progress either in knowledge or in faith. So as far as I'm concerned, doubt has a very meaningful purpose in my life. It allows me to acknowledge my limitations. It confirms and then challenges my core beliefs. And it doesn't take anything away. Rather, it's the part in which it lets my faith grow. So what is being offered as we begin entering into the text is to understand that doubt is part of learning how to be good disciples, learning how to be more Christ-like. So let's go and move forward into verses 19 and 20. And this is what Jesus says to his disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You have to start by acting. Nothing gets accomplished without action. I love the quote that says, the first step of a journey is great not for the distance it covers, but for the direction it heralds. We need that first action step. We need to go. Disciples cannot stay on that mountaintop any more than we can stay in this sanctuary. We have a direction to go, to move away from what is safe and comfortable and and stable and go toward the more excellent way of living. And that first action is to move your feet. Always move your feet. Discipleship is really about moving your feet. Now the next phrase is to make disciples. Making disciples. Now it's interesting because we know that old proverb that says something like, you can lead a horse to water, right? But you can't make the horse drink it. We're called to make disciples. Or we could perhaps make it more personal. You can present someone with an opportunity, but you cannot force her or him to take advantage of the opportunity. Same intent, same message. There's no doubt that I believe that we as, a, as the beloved community need to go out into the world sharing the good news of God's love, living Christ-like, embodying the fruit of the Spirit, but we cannot make disciples. We can't coerce or, 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 or make them afraid, and we've tried it before. Church history proves that. Coercion and fear may have been strategies used in the church history, or they may even be strategies used in the fundamentalist world of today. When you interpret to make as the authoritative mandate to force others to believe or to become like them, we have missed the mark. That's not what it means to make. 
So let me modernize the, the term to make so we can understand it better. Contextually, what I'll suggest is to make does not mean to make converts as much as it means to attract students. To make is to set up, to offer opportunities that creates environments that lead people along the path toward Christ-like living, nurturing others, simply how to integrate Christ's core values into their daily lives. It's a whole different kind of syllabus when we think of it that way. We are called to attract others. And think about that. Think about all that implies and assumes. Think about what role our role looks like when we understand the phrase to make as to attract. So the next part of the edict says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, right? Go, therefore, make all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Now, my bias is going to go up, show up here, and um, it is what it is. But it doesn't say, teach them doctrine. It doesn't say, teach them proper belief. It doesn't say, teach them the 10-step sinner's prayer. It says, teach them obedience to what Jesus commanded. Literally, obey means to conform to one's action. So what Jesus is inviting his disciples back then on that mountaintop, and hopefully what Jesus is inviting us today is to teach others how to conform to his actions, to his commandments. And what is that that pops into your head, what Jesus commands? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So what Jesus wants us to do is to teach how obedience to loving God and loving one another. It's that simple sometimes. Not a very long book, but it's simple that time, that at times. Jesus wants us to attract others and teach them how to love one another. And that's where I'm going, and I'm going to push you. I'm going to entreat you to go with me towards simply the practice of loving God and loving each other. First John 4 says what? I didn't know it either. I had to look it up, so don't worry. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. Because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So if we are going to be disciples, take that great commission, then it will be in the way that we love others. When Jesus says to them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, nations doesn't mean in the modern sense of the word nation, but for us, it's more like foreigners, tribes of people who are not like us. I came upon this quote from Leonard Sweet. It's 50 years old. It's hard to believe. But he writes, the paradox that the Holy Spirit unites as the Holy Spirit diversifies, and the stronger the community, the more differences there will be in the people who make it up. Jesus instructs his disciples to become more accepting of others, less judgmental of them, offering a compassionate presence, and together live in the community of Christ at its center. So the question that I would raise for your reflection is, how are you positioning yourself to influence others toward Christ-like living? Or how are you fulfilling your invitation to go and attract others who are different to love one another. So let me, let me make this a little bit more concrete. Think about the person who, is, who drives you crazy. Those pers that person who you don't like in your life. Think about that person who annoys you, aggravates you, provokes you. Think about that person. We all got them, and don't you be lying to me, because we all know there's someone in our life that we just don't like it, but we're forced to deal with. The person who is demanding, who gets up in your face with bad breath, metaphorically speaking, or literally speaking. 
the one who challenges you, always wants something more from you. Nothing is ever good. That's who you need to love more. And loving that person more is exactly that first step. That's your action step. Because we can't love someone we're not in a relationship with. Loving someone is something personal. So we are invited to teach others, to attract others, to love like Christ loved. Keep that person in your mind. And then put that person in your heart. And then just take that one step. But there's also one more thing I want you to listen to before I, I finish. Jesus says, remember, what does he say? Remember, I am with you always. We're not in this thing alone. We're not in this love thing alone. We have been given Christ's presence. The Spirit is with us, nudging us, prodding us, nurturing us toward loving each other. To live lives that reveal who Christ is. And that's a comforting thing for me because I don't have to do it all on my own. I don't have to feel frustrated or isolated or discouraged because I, we have the promise of Christ the gift, I am always with you. So when I screw up, which is like once every 25 years or every 25 minutes, when I choose not to love the one who's provoking me, I know that um, Christ is there nudging me along the way for the next time to take a healthy step toward loving rather than to walk away. It is that easy sometimes. So let me invite you to go and attract others to a better way of life. A way that embodies God's love for the world. And that's how we'll participate as disciples in this great commission to go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have commanded you and remember I am with you always let us pray